But I will uh, do a quick review of the first few verses of chapter 5 that we've already gone over, and then go into some new verses. So let's go to Mark 5, verse 1, and begin reading. And they came over unto the other side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, under the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. Okay, here we have Jesus healing a demoniac at Gadara. That's where we're at. Uh, we've had an example of Jesus casting out Satan, and you remember that the whole Bible is all about this one great conflict. Your life, the life of the world, the whole universe is all about one thing, God and Satan. God is the most powerful, he is almighty, he is infinitely powerful, but then you have Satan, the second most powerful, but nowhere near as powerful as God. And the whole Bible's about this conflict. We are pawns in this conflict. Both sides want us. As we, this morning in worship, will be reminded of the word redeemer, redemption. Uh, which means to buy back. And the human race was created by God in God's image at first. God owned the human race. It was his. And all of the joy that that gives the human race. But Satan got it. Through temptation and sin, Adam and Eve and everybody on down. We weren't gods anymore. We weren't in the image of God anymore. We weren't his people anymore. We weren't his children we now became children of Satan, children of disobedience, as the Bible says, outside of God, separated from God, as I have on the board there with that wall of sin. But God wants to get us back from Satan. And that's what redemption means, to buy back. You own something, you lost it, and then later on you came and bought the same thing back. That's what redemption means. And Jesus is called our Redeemer in the Bible. He is the one who bought us back to God by his own death. That was the payment. That paid for our sins. So God could forgive us our sins and be his again forever in heaven. In the new world, the new heavens, and the new earth that will be heaven. So that's, that's the overview. And... Uh, Jesus is showing his power over Satan and the evil angels in the book of Mark. We've seen it many times. We saw it in chapter 1. We saw it in chapter 3. Here's another one that we're now looking at in chapter 5. Uh, Jesus also showed his infinite power uh, so far in Mark by healing many sick people of all kinds of diseases in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. And he's shown his power over all of the forces of nature, over all creation in chapter 4 by calming the great tempest on the Sea of Galilee. But so far in Mark, Jesus has not raised up a dead person. That will be the climax of chapter 5. Okay, now looking at chapter 5, verse 1. It says, And they came over, meaning Jesus and his apostles. This goes back to chapter 4. Uh, they had entered a boat at, on Capernaum, on the side, uh, northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. At evening, they'd crossed the sea during the great storm and now had come 
as it says here, over to the other, meaning the southeast shore, the opposite shore of the side of the Sea of Galilee, probably early the next morning. To the country of the Gadarenes, named after Gadara, the main town of the region. This was a predominantly Gentile area, as is shown by the herd of swine being there that we're going to run into in verse 11. And you know the swine were uh, forbidden to the Jews, to, to the Old Testament believers. God had forbidden that uh, uh, animal to be kept. The only other times uh, we pointed out uh, the Gospels report Christ having gone out of Galilee, Judea, Samaria borders, the land of the Jews, was to Tyre and Sidon, which we're going to come to in chapter 7. Jesus did not see his main task coming into this world as evangelizing Gentile territories. We're going to see the, the Apostle Paul being a great example of that in the book of Acts. So he would leave that task of taking the gospel of salvation into the Gentile world uh, to his disciples. So Gadara is that uh, lower left-hand corner of that big pink area on the east side of the map. Uh, Gadara. Uh, it's in the territory that that big pink area is called the Decapolis which means in Latin, the Ten Cities. Uh, it includes also the famous city of Damascus, which is uh, important in the book of Acts. But anyway, it is included in the country of Syria today. Here we will see evangelism work done in this account of this uh, possessed man among the Gentiles. It's going to happen. Jesus commands after the man after he's... Uh, rid of these uh, evil angels that have possessed him. Jesus tells him, go back to your town and tell all your friends and neighbors and relatives. Tell them what I have done for you. Tell them about me. Uh, so he's not going to forbid this, this Gentile man from uh, telling others, as he will uh, the Jews. And we've discussed why that is. This is probably because the Jews connected earthly political ideas with the Messiah, but the Gentiles would not have. And then in verse 2, uh, it talks about, it introduces this man with an unclean spirit. Uh, the unclean spirits, the demons, we're going to see that there's many of them in this man. They all identify as one, though. Uh, anyway, they, uh, they possess his entire person, uh, body, mind, and soul, as will be described below. Verse 3, he dwelt among the tombs. Uh, this is a mountainous area on the side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, there's many cliffs, and in cliffs you have uh, tombs, you have uh, caves. Now, the important thing here in verse 3 is the triple no, the, the triple negative. No man could bind him, no, not with chains. This is beyond the help of any man. We cannot defeat Satan. We are not powerful enough. And this is what God is pointing out, especially in this chapter and in the previous chapter with the stilling of the storm. We cannot control the weather. We cannot stop hurricanes and tornadoes and thunderstorms and lightning. and all. We have no control over the wind and the waves. God does. But now we see the important thing here is he has power of the devil, our great adversary. If you try to take the devil on loan, you're going to get whipped. You're going to get completely defeated forever. This is what most people try to do in this life. But this is, this is the important message that all four of these miracles in a row that Jesus is going to do all clearly point out this is beyond the scope of man to do. These are, these are our enemies that we cannot defeat. They will defeat us. So we must go to the true God, Jesus Christ, our 
Savior being God the Son. Kevin? Absolutely. The true triune God. Okay. So why does an unbeliever, it's all unbelievers, uh, why doesn't Satan, I know Satan's, Satan's with them, but why doesn't Satan fill them like he did this guy here? Well, that's a good question. He does, but just not body, mind, and soul. Every unbeliever and every human being coming into the world is in the image of sinful Adam, under the control of Satan, knowing good and evil. Uh, so we are all possessed of the, de of the devil by nature, but not to this extent. This is a very extreme case, very obvious case. Oh, he would. He would like to possess us all like this. God prevents him from doing that. God has allowed Satan, the evil angels, to possess this man in this very extreme way for our learning. Not only for his benefit, but for the people he's going to go back and tell about. Uh, the apostles are going to witness this, and they're going to write about it. We hear about it right now today. Uh, God allows these things to happen, uh, Satan to do this for a good reason. But by the grace of God, he prevents most people from being possessed like this. Does that address the question? Okay. Not, God is almighty. Nothing can happen without God's permission. Not even Satan can do what he wants without God permitting it. Okay, but I emphasize in verse three, those three no's. No man could bind him. No, not with chains. Now, who can be bound with chains? Almost anybody. Chains are very strong, you know. I mean, you, you can tow trucks with chains, <laughs> let alone flesh and blood. Okay, but not even chains could hold this man. This man was obviously... Uh, danger to others, as he's described here. Uh, as we read in Matthew and Luke, the account, the, the same account, we have other details of how dangerous this man was, being possessed of demons. Uh, he'd hide in the mountains, he'd hide in the tombs, uh, the caves, and as people would come near, trying to travel, uh, he would rush out upon the road with wild cries and horrible threats upon anybody that tried to pass. He'd run around naked, we're told, in Luke, being of such unusual strength that no one uh, who had tried to chain the man, because he was such a threat to their community, so he could not harm other people, that they couldn't do it. Nobody had been successful. He was notorious, he was famous. He was a monster. He was terrorizing this entire region. This wasn't some unknown guy. He was the biggest terror in this region. And uh, verse 4. It goes on to explain verse 3. that The chains, what had happened to the chains when they tried to bind him? When, when a group of men would, would grab him and try to chain him down, you know, in effect, jail him, what had happened? Well, the chains it had been plucked asunder. That means torn in two. He just tear the chains in two pieces. And then the fetters broken in pieces. That means literally smashed to pieces. He could smash metal with his bare hands. Was it because this man had developed great strength himself? Where did his strength to do this come from? The evil angels. It shows you how powerful they are, not just physically, but spiritually. That's right. Yeah, yeah, very good. But his strength, of course, came from God. Uh, but what God is trying to teach us here is the great strength of, of the evil angels who are against us. 
They're our enemies. They hate us with cruel hatred, the Bible says. And uh, the last thing Satan wants is for you to end up in paradise. He's worked hard to get you out of paradise, and he doesn't want you to get back in. So he uses his great strength against us, and we, we dare not uh, think that Satan is weak or that he can't get us if we let down our guard, as the Bible says. Be sober, be vigilant, for your enemy, the devil, prowls around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, the Bible says. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, these are people possessed of the devil in a higher degree, you know, than, than the average. But people who love sin, I mean, that's, that's of the devil. They, they see nothing wrong with abortion. They see nothing wrong with homosexuality. They don't see nothing wrong with breaking the Ten Commandments in, in, in all kinds of ways. That's demon possession of their soul. They, they, can't, they can't tell right from wrong. So great strength is what is being exhibited here in this possessed man. The evil angels have great supernatural strength. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in high places, the Bible says. And we can't defeat them without the armor that God gives us through his word and sacraments and so forth. Uh, Some people would look at this uh, in the heterodox churches uh, or skeptics and atheists, they'd, they'd read this and they oh, the man was just insane. You know, he was, here's a case of insanity. It's not demon possession. There's no devil. There's no evil angels. You know, they don't believe that. Well, then how do you, how do you explain the great strength? Insane people don't have supernatural strength to break chains. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, just we'll ignore that part. We'll explain it away. They're very good at that. So, uh, what he's teaching us here here is the second most powerful force in the universe. And it's unseen to us, but we're told of it in the Bible. So we believe it. But there's a greater strength, one greater, one infinitely stronger than Satan is God. And he's the only one that can defeat him, and he wants to defeat him for us through Jesus Christ and the gospel. Only God can overcome Satan's rule in our lives. We can't do it ourselves. We can't make a decision for Christ or ask Jesus. And, you know, there's nothing we can do. God alone must do it. He brings us to faith. He overcomes Satan in our life. It's his gift to us. Lest any man should boast, as the Bible says. We can't boast of defeating Satan in any way. We, we, have, we have very little strength. Isn't there a Bible verse that talks about the apostles trying to exercise a demon out of somebody and they couldn't do it? That's right, yeah. They, they went back and said, Jesus, why couldn't we do this? You know, you cast the demon out of this man. We couldn't do it. We tried, we couldn't do it. Yeah. Only, only Jesus can do it. Or those that do, you know, call upon him to do it, and he chooses to do it. But all kinds of verses in the Bible, this is a main message of the Bible, that only God can overcome Satan's rule in our lives through Jesus Christ. Obviously, this possessed man couldn't do it. He couldn't free himself from Satan's power Uh, from these evil angels that possessed him. And he couldn't do it, and no other human being could do it. He was helpless. Everyone else was helpless. But look at what Jesus is going to do. Only Jesus can do it. That's the lesson here. The lesson for us is uh, the strength of the devil and his angels was too great for human strength. Jesus is not just human, though. He is also eternal God. Uh, 
Man's science couldn't do it. Man's ingenuity couldn't do it. Man's inventiveness, man's brain power couldn't do it either. Not just man's physical attempts. So this is what we call a miracle. Uh, it's beyond the scope of man to do. Only God can do it. We saw a miracle at the end of chapter 4 with the calming of the storm, commanding the, 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 the atmosphere, the clouds, the air, the, the water, commanding it all. That's a miracle. And we're going to see it in the next two miracles in chapter 5 also. We're going to see four examples here of things that to this day man has no power over. Man cannot rid himself of. But Jesus is going to prove his almighty power over situations that are totally beyond the power of man in all four of these, these miracles. What is it going to teach us? What's the lesson? Not just that the Satan is very powerful, not just that God is almighty powerful. What's that going to teach us then, therefore? Right? Jesus is God. And so, teach us to do what? What's the outcome for us with all that? Who do we trust? Yeah, trust only God. Put all your trust in God, the true triune God, Jesus Christ being God the Son. Don't trust in what? Yourself. Yourself. Your own strength, your own abilities, your own goodness, your own anything. You cannot save yourself from Satan. He's got you. The only one who can save you is Jesus, just as in the case of this uh, possessed man. No, I don't think so. Even by what they, they write. You got all the Baptists on, you know, the reform, what we call the reformed churches. They think that you can save yourself by bringing yourself to faith in Jesus. Like, well, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. They teach that. They all teach that. But then they don't teach that that's it. That that alone saves you. Then it's always, now you have to do this. Jesus brought you most of the way. You got to carry yourself across the finish line. You got to do your part as if you can. But the Bible says we are dead in trespasses and sins. What can a dead person do? Nothing. Jesus saves us completely, 100%. It's all a gift. On the other side, you got the, the, the Pope's church. He says, yeah, Jesus is God who died for your sins. But now you have to do penance. You've got to do your part now. The Baptists say, and all their offshoots, you've got to bring yourself to faith in Jesus. That's your work. That's why they don't think babies can do it. And uh, then the... Then you got the Pope's church who says, you've got to do your good works now. You've got to add to what Jesus did with your life of penance. When Luther rose up in the church of Rome and said, the Bible says, by grace you're saved, by faith alone. What did the Pope's church say to Luther? Oh, yes, you're right. No, they said, Cursed be you, Luther. We're excommunicating you for that. You're not saved by faith in Christ alone. That's just part of it. And to this day, they've never recounted that. Never re recounted that. I don't think it's written, but I think that's what the other churches doing outside of the Baptists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're very similar. They're all really the same. They're all Jesus plus. You're saved by Jesus plus you. The Lutheran confessions are the only ones that say, no, it's not Jesus and you, it's Jesus. It's God. He saves you by his grace. He brings you to faith. 
He works the good works in you. That's what the Bible says. I assume it's because they just have trouble believing it, and therefore they feel they have to have a part. It makes them feel good that they've done that, and therefore that's their reassurance. That's right, yeah. Well, I think it's because you were grown up with the idea that if you want something, you have to earn it. That's right. That, that's, that's innate in our sinful nature. And this is what the Bible calls the difference between pride and humility. Uh, pride cometh before the fall. It's a pride that I can do something to help save myself. I have that ability. That's, that's what the Bible calls pride. Humility is, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Period. I can do nothing. I'm dead. I need to be raised to life. Read Ephesians 2. Brings it really out very clearly. 2 Corinthians 12, or 1 Corinthians 12. No man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's God. You can't make a decision for Christ on your own. It's not your decision. It's the work of the Holy Ghost in you. God, the third person of the Trinity. It's all a gift of God. You can reject it. You can, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can reject it. That's all you can do. You know, I, I was reading this thing on Facebook about diabetes and there's some stuff that people are working on. And somebody in the comments says, well, if God really loved me, why did he give me diabetes? And I replied back to that about how wrong that is. The first time I replied back to me, you know, and, and their sin. A few people like my, my comment. But I thought, boy, how upset is God to hear you blame him after all he's done for you? Yeah. You know, the, the anger a man would have would be unlimited. Now, it's, 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 it's that pride. It's a, another form of that pride welling up. Like, I'm a good person. Why, why would God give me this punishment? I'm, I'm good. Yeah, well, they, they don't give Satan any credit for the evil that's in their life. They, they credit God for their evil. Yeah, God's the evil one, not me. It's his fault. Yeah, and you know, that, that's just like Adam and Eve, isn't it? Yeah. In Genesis 3. After they sin, they blame God. Yeah, you gave me that woman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just, it, it's just in our human nature. Yeah, if I'm going to hell, I'm going to pull as many as I can from the human race with me. Right. Yeah, yeah. Hate. But, uh, yeah, most people think they're very alive to God without Jesus. Uh, they're very good people. I've talked to thousands of them. They've all said that. Not all of them, but most of them. Right. Except the Christ believers. That's right. I'm talking about a true Lutheran, which means you follow the Lutheran confessions, the six Lutheran confessions, which are based totally upon the Bible. They came out of the Lutheran Reformation. But most so-called Lutherans don't even follow Lutheran confessions anymore, let alone the Bible. Yeah, in regards to the diabetes thing, people take the major issues they have in life and say, God doesn't love me, and it's God's fault. They don't look at it, one, as the, the being sinful. But what about all the smaller things that don't go well in their they don't look as bad Same. as, as, as their sin as well. Yeah. Uh, unless their life is absolutely the way they want it to be, it's God's fault. That's, that's the view of sinful man. Yeah. But they believe in God. <laughs> At least they believe in God so they can blame him. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to blame it on Satan and myself. I'm going to blame it on God. That's how perverted man in his sin is. But anyway, getting back to verse 4 here. Uh, look at the end of verse 4. It repeats that triple negative in verse 3. Neither could any man tame him. 
again showing that uh, it's really emphasizing here this is beyond any human ability to stop what's going on with this demon possessed man. God wants to make that clear before he gets down to Jesus entering the picture. Let's take man out of the picture first. Man, man tried, he can't do anything about it. Now Jesus comes in. And that's the way it is with conversion. People won't trust in Jesus as their God and only Savior until they get themselves out of the picture. When they say, well, I can't help myself, I'm going to hell. They have to confess that and repent of that and say, I can't save myself. I lose trust in myself. Now I can put my trust in Jesus. But I can't trust in myself and Jesus. God is a jealous God. He says, I want all the praise. I want all the credit. I don't want to share it with you. Like, well, I praise God because he did part of it but I praise myself because I did some of it too. God doesn't want that. He wants all the praise for our salvation. And when this is all over, when, when this demonic is healed, does, is it Jesus did it plus the demoniac? He helped him? Did the apostles help here? No, they're just witnesses of what Jesus did. Verse 5. Okay, going on to describe how possessed this man was, he did not have a house. He didn't live in a house like most people do. It says he was sometimes living in the tombs, in the caves, in the cliffs, where they bury dead bodies. And he was sometimes roaming the mountains in that region. He was given no rest, no respite from this possession. Day and night, it says day and night, right? That's, that's even in his sleep. He got no rest. He was, what's the word? Always. Always what? Always crying. Does that mean weeping, shedding tears? Well, that might have been part of it, but what that really means is he was what? No, he was shrieking. He was, he was crying out. In agony. And what else was he doing in that verse? Cutting himself with stones. Cutting himself with stones. We see this back in chapter 1 in the first incidence of uh, Jesus healing a demoniac. He was also hurting himself. But it wasn't really him hurting himself, it was the demons in him hurting him, causing him to cut himself with stones. But anyway, uh, picture yourself seeing this man. What if he walked in our door right now? This is what you'd see. What would it do to you to to see a man like this? Yeah, he'd terrorize you. You'd run away from this guy. Well, that's what was happening in this region. You don't want to run into this guy. (laughs) We've tried to stop him, but we can't do it. So the best thing you can do is just stay as far away from him as you can. Uh, So this was not him doing it, it was the demons who possessed him. Uh, He he injured himself, not because he wanted to, but because he was demon-possessed. And so it is with all unbelievers. They're hurting themselves, but they don't even know it. It's Satan hurting them, but they're, they're cooperating with their sin. They're hurting themselves. Uh, and, and there's so many demon-possessed people today. I mean, they're not like this. 
I've never seen one like this, but every unbeliever is demon-possessed. And they're terrible people. They're terrible to hurting themselves, and they're hurting the people around them. And Yeah. Starts screaming at you. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, there was. She was possessed in a little bit greater degree than the average unbeliever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as, as you said a moment ago, Kevin, Satan would like to do this to all of us. He'd like us all to be like this guy. He'd like to possess us all to this degree. But only God prevents it. Okay, let's go to verse 6. Now that we've covered some background. But when he saw Jesus, this possessed man saw Jesus afar off getting out of the boat, he ran and worshipped him. Now this, this verse might be confusing to the average reader. And they would say, oh, the man had faith in Jesus. He, he worshipped him as God. Oh, no, no, no. That's not what this means. you got to remember, the evil spirits had taken over this man's what? His soul and his mind and his body. He had no control over anything. He was totally under the control of these demons. And they're seeking to destroy him. And so who is... Who is uh, running and worshiping Jesus here? The man or the demons? No, the demons. They're controlling the man. The man has no control. That's, you know, it's, it's, well, the man's doing it, but, but it's the demons making him do it. Yeah, but he, he can't do anything about it. He, he's totally under the control and possession of the demons. Well, I understand that, but I also read it as he knew that Jesus could help him, or he could help Jesus. No, Jesus. no, the demons know that. The demons, and they're going to say in the next verse. But it's the demons who are... Who are causing the man to run and to, as it says, worship Jesus. Now, not worship him in the faith sense, in the, in the belief sense, but falling down before him and begging him sense. Okay, in that sense, they, they worship him through this man's body. They're controlling the man's voice. Whatever they want to say they're going to use the man's voice to say. Without the man's consent, the man isn't consenting to any of this. He goes where they guide him. The man is no longer in control of his body and his faculties. We might expect that when the demon possessing the man saw Jesus approaching, the demons would have what? Compelled the man to do what? Run away from Jesus. Jesus is their enemy. They know he's God. You would expect them to make the man run away from Jesus. But they don't. We're going to get to that. They're not going to hide from Jesus. They're going to do just the opposite. They're going to run to Jesus, this, the demons, and they're going to fall before him because they know he is God, almighty. And they fall before him, and the reason for this will be revealed in the words of the demons in the following verse. Not to worship him in the sense of faith and love, but fear. Okay, they're going to fear him as God the Son, and what he can do to them. They know he is their judge. Their eternal uh, fate rests in his hands alone. And they're afraid he's going to do what? To, he's come to do what to them? 
Yep. Yep. Sent him to hell. This same thing happened back in chapter one. Look at chapter one. Remind yourself of the first exorcism in Mark one. Uh, verse 23. Jesus goes to the synagogue, the church on Sunday, or Saturday in this case, as it was, and there was in their synagogue a man with what? And he did what? Yeah, it, and it really wasn't him, it was the demon that uh, possessed him. And what did the demon say through this man in the synagogue? Verse 24. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Thou art come to what? Destroy us. I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. <laughs> well, this is the same thing here. They know they can't hide from Jesus. Jesus will find them wherever they go. And they're thinking he's come to destroy us. That's why they run to him and beg him not to do it. Okay? In verse 6 of chapter 5, that's why they run to him and worship him. And we'll see them say that very similar to what they, the, the demon said in chapter 1, verse 24, in 5, 7. They're afraid that God has come to punish them. They know who Jesus is. They don't want us to know who Jesus is, but they know. They know that he is God. He is the one power stronger than them in the universe. So they're going to try to beg him not to destroy them. Now verse 7. And they cried with a loud voice. And said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. That's not the man saying that. That's the demon, or the demons, who act as one in possessing this man. Notice in verse 7, they cry with a loud voice. They speak as one. We're going to find out their legion, which means thousands. But they speak with one voice and a loud voice, yelling with all of their might, using this man's voice at Jesus. And, and they're, they're, they're ugly. They're vicious in this voice. They're not doing it uh, in a humble way with all of the hatred that they can in their saying this. Now, you got to look at this, and we're almost out of time, but I wanted you to point at verse 7 and 8. Compare verse 7 and 8. 8. For he said unto them, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. That happened before Verse 7. You see? You see how that's written? That word for means because. Why did the demons cry this with a loud voice in verse 7? Because first Jesus had said to them, Come out of the man. So you've got to flip that around chronologically. You understand what I'm getting at? So they run. They carry this man in their possession up to Jesus, fall down before him, and Jesus says, come out of him. But before they do, they say what's in verse 7. Okay? As a result of what Jesus says in verse 8, they say what they say in verse 7. But again, they know Jesus as their great enemy. Here's the two great enemies in the universe confronting each other face to face. They know that Jesus alone has the power of God to destroy them. And so they say, what have I to do with thee, Jesus? In other words, what that literally means is, leave us alone, Jesus. You have nothing to do with me. I have nothing to do with you. Just leave me alone. 
Leave us alone. Let us continue to possess this man. We would put it this way. Mind your own business. Let us carry on our evil work. That's what they're in effect saying. What have you to do with us? What have we to do with you? Mind your own business. Well, the, the good angels, the holy angels, the ones who haven't fallen, uh, they obey God's command. They go wherever God tells them they're God's messengers and servants. The evil angels can only do what God allows them to do. Okay. Of God's judgment? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, every, every, everybody in pain ought to be falling down before Jesus today and saying, save me. I'm in great danger. Uh, God has the power to, as, he, as Jesus said, cast both soul and body into hell. Fear him. But they don't fear God. They think they're good people. They don't need Jesus. Right? Or else they'd be here. <laughs> they think they're doing okay. All right, we're out of time. Shall we close there for this morning with the benediction? And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all. Amen.